Hello everyone, welcome to the Race of Death Hacktoberfest Help Desk. My name is Joe and I am your host for the show this evening. If you're new to the show, uh, the Hacktoberfest Help Desk is your place to get help with all things Hacktoberfest during the month of October, during Hacktoberfest. We are coming to you live three times a day throughout uh, every weekday in Hacktoberfest, so that's eight days remaining now, I believe. Um, and we're here to give you tips and tricks around uh, solving your Hacktoberfest problems, landing those PRs, uh, helping you identify new projects and new ways to contribute to those projects. So every day we have a variety of special guests who are showing us new cool things, walking us through their code and their growth or showing us projects that we can get involved with or showing us new ways of doing things. And that is exactly what we've got coming up very shortly with a special guest today. Uh, we'll be looking at some um, process and some cool ways to uh, automate releases on your repository or to make releases better on your repository rather. Um, we will hope maybe be making some leaps and some bloops. I don't know if we decided yet. Um, this can be a good show. Uh, for those of you who like what you see today and want to tune in again, uh, as I said, we're here three times a day and we do have a schedule that you can go see and you can pick what shows you want to tune into at twitch.tv raise devs schedule that is updated weekly. So it currently shows the schedule through for this week. At the end of the show, stick around and I'll tell you a little bit about the guests to come. Uh, I'll run you through the, the schedule for Thursday and Friday. Um, and over the weekend, hey Nicholas, thanks for joining. Um, over the weekend, um, I will update the schedule to be for next week as well. So the final thing for me before I bring on our guest, sorry, two things for me before I bring on our guest. First of all, uh, as I said, we are here to help you. So please ask questions in chat. We will answer those questions, uh, whether they are relevant to what we're talking about or not. You're very welcome to ask anything at any point. If it's uh, a bit of a tangent, it might take us a little bit longer to get to it because we'll finish what we're talking about and circle around. Contrary to popular belief, for some reason, the theme of the week has been people asking us if we're actually live because we don't immediately answer their questions. And so they think they think we were recording. We are actually live, I promise you. Uh, it's just sometimes we'll finish the topic we're on and then we'll get around to your question if uh, we can. Um, but please continue to challenge us and see if we're, we're not actually pre-recording. It's very entertaining for me. Nicholas, don't you even dare. I will remove your VIP and put you back down there with the users. Um, so uh, the other thing about the chat, if you have any links or URLs that you want to share, such as to projects you're working on or to things you've got questions about, you're very welcome to share those URLs uh, and those links. Just let us know at raise devs in the chat and just mention me and say that, hey, can I share a link? I will then permit you so that the bot doesn't ban you because the internet is a scary place. So we have a bot set up to auto filter out any links and to time out people who post them. But if you give me a warning, I'll make sure that does not happen to you. At least one, but it's only for five seconds. It's a short little timeout. And at least one person every show manages to get themselves put in the corner by the bot. Uh, so it's not a big deal, but we can avoid that happening if you just let me know in advance. Um, so that's that. And then the final thing, if you've never heard of Raze.dev and you have no idea what we are or what we do or why we're here, uh, we are a service to help you level up in your developer career, whether you're trying to get your first developer job, trying to get promotion, trying to be for mid-level or senior, trying to become a better engineering manager, whatever it is, we are here to help. Um, hmm, I see that my camera quality is really terrible. I've been having some internet issues. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully this calms down. Um, if Nicholas in the chat, can you confirm if you are seeing me in potato quality as well? Um, just so I know, so I can keep an eye on it. That'd be super useful. Hey, Dexter, thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, we are here to help you. And the way we do that is through expert coaches who have lots of experience in their industries. You can sign up for free at raise.dev and we will help you out and get you the experience you need to move to a new job. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Michaela. That's super useful. Hmm. What are we to do about that? This is a, uh, for anyone who follows me on Twitter, you'll know that I've been complaining about the streaming laptop, well, the laptop I use for streaming, um, because it's garbage. And it's currently 94 degrees in my laptop, and all I'm doing is running a browser. Um, so worst case scenario, I'll have to change machines, and we'll have to improvise. Um, is my sound OK? Is that working? Sound is fine. Is that fine? Let me know. I'll briefly, cool, sound is good. Okay, worst case scenario, I turn my camera off. Anyway, that's all the ramble. Let's bring on our, our wonderful guest for the day who has a decidedly high quality camera. Uh, please welcome Mr. Hugh Rawlinson to the show. Bonsoir. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome, how are you doing? Pretty good, Joe, how are you doing? I am wondering why my laptop is garbage, but otherwise I'm good. Um, your, your video quality has just improved a lot, so fingers crossed. It's, my, my video is delighted to have you on the show and decided to put his acting. <laughs> it got performance anxiety and had to catch up. Um, there we so, go. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself to the fine viewers? 
Sure. I should have thought about this for more than three seconds. Um, <laughs> so my name is Hugh Rawlinson. I'm a developer. Um, I've worked on a lot of different things over the course of my career. I've been I've been a Java backend developer. That was a time. And I've been a, a React developer at the moment. I'm working on sort of um, web build systems and uh, an internal web developer platform for some developers of my company. In the past, I've been a developer advocate um, helping developers build cool stuff with APIs. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Building cool stuff is neat, and we're going to be talking about some cool stuff today. So I hear my camera's good now. Thank you for the confirmation in chat. Um, so yes, um, we how this is going to go for the folks who are watching. Uh, we'll chat about Hugh's developer interest a little bit, um, and I guess like kind of your 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 developer journey and some of the things that you're into. And then I believe there's something in particular you want to talk to us about around semantic release, which I'm very excited to hear more about. Um, we had uh, a guest who briefly touched on semantic release in an earlier stream. So I'm excited to dig into it. And the blog post that I believe you're basing this on has a, a lot of like spiky edges that you work around, which is awesome. And then um, we we were chatting, me and he were chatting last night and we were like, what else can we do on the stream? And we came up with quite frankly, a, a, an awesome list of many, many things. Um, and so the back end of the show is gonna be a, a variety grab bag. We're just gonna choose some stuff and roll with it. Uh, and you in chat can guide us in that madness. Um, so yeah, it's going to be great. Yeah, awesome. Should we kick off? Um, so I guess to start, uh, I want to start. We we kind of did this thing on the show where we we kind of like start talking a little bit about like the the, the guests developer journey and how they got started and interesting in development and the technology interest now. Uh, where did where did that journey start for you? Like, what was your original uh, entry into the wonderful and bizarre world of terrible computers? Um. So I think I had a kind of a weird one, maybe. Well, I don't know, actually, come to think of it, there's a lot of developers who've had probably a similar one that I that I know. Um, I, when I was in school, was a musician. I used to play quite a lot of guitar and bass and drums. I played in bands. Um, I like to record music. I like to record other people's music who I went to school with. We were on Spotify once. Um, that was fun. Uh, I liked to uh understand how the computers like did the signal processing right so um for some reason I, I was also interested in programming for some reason i decided that at that point at my first my first intro to programming right. had to be about music which made it harder right <laughs> so my first um sort of programming language that i found and remember writing code in when i was in school is actually um a a programming language called Chuck. Um, Should I throw this screen up? Would that be sure? Easy? Yeah. Woo. So yeah. Chuck in is this? It's it's called a strongly timed programming language. Um, Which is so cute. <laughs> in music, timing is so port, so important. They you have to like specifically address time while you're programming. Right. Um, and it's it's used in it's it's not widely used. It's used in like a few academic settings right. for specific. Yeah, I mean, as you can see there, like it was a PhD thesis, right? Originally, exactly. So. Yeah, and and so um, Go on, who started writing it, um, it was his PhD thesis, and he yeah. has students use it in uh, in laptop orchestras at, right. at two universities. I think he's currently at Stanford. And he's yeah. running this laptop orchestra there now. They all, I, it's a course, and they all sort of write the code that yeah. they use then to perform live. That's super cool. Great. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, I've just noticed something on this page that like really speaks of like the era when this was like made. This page was made. That line that says "coast to coast mirrors." What <laughs> a, a mirror in Princeton and a mirror in, Stan in Stanford. So you can get fast <laughs> uploads, uh, download speed. Now, which coast you're on? Oh, uh, that reminds me of like SourceForge. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I started programming with this. It's it's a tough language to program in now. Looking back, like I definitely miss a lot of the stuff that I now just have in in JavaScript or Python or whatever. Right. Um, and I remember at one point I was implementing map filter and reduce in Chuck to try and like make it usable. Um, right. Uh, but I ended up 
you know, going to university and studying um, under one of the lecture, one of my lecturers who had worked on a part of Chuck for audio analysis, mm -hmm. her name is Rebecca Fiebrink, and she teaches at uh, University of the Arts London now. At the time, it was Goldsmiths um, in London. Uh, and so, yeah, um, music, really. That's how I got into programming. Yeah, another thing I've just noticed is completely off track, but down the bottom there, they've got Chuck for Unity now, with a very unfortunate name, <laughs> Unity. <laughs> um, but that's really cool. It's nice to see the project still going in new directions. Yeah. Um, nice. Very cool. It's, it's actually... Um, there's a book. Let me grab this book. Okay. <clears throat> brief me, brief detour while uh, you guys. This book. <laughs> I literally just I saw that link and literally just opened that up because that sounded really cool. It's so good. It's this comic of yeah, you know how to do interactive design and it's like photographs and illustrations with. That's comic amazing. Text. It's yeah. so good. Um, so like, how is that linked to, to Chuck? It's by the people who did Chuck or. So Go Go Wang um, is currently working on more sort of design research and like interaction design research, and right. he uses Chuck in this interaction design work. Mm -hmm. um, but part of his like his um, his work involved writing this book, and he's also doing streams at the moment under the like brand Artful Design. Um, right. He's doing those. Uh, during um, lockdown, during coronavirus. Nice. So yeah. Um, Very cool. Is this going to be the third book I buy today? Yes, it is. Yes, is this going to be the third book I buy as a result of a stream today? Yes, it is. It's available <laughs> at all.com. Perfect. Streams are making me poor. Anyway. <laughs> So yeah, cool. So you started with Chuck, which is like an esoteric start to programming, let's be honest. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like, uh, so I did also do like the Windows logo thing at some right. point. I have no idea when I did that. I just know that it's in my memory somewhere. Um, I remember writing a little bit of Java in high school after I had started with Chuck. Right. Um, then I went to university to actually study music production first. I right. did a year of music and sonic media before switching over into music computing at Goldsmiths, where I used Chuck along with Java and Max MSP, which is a visual programming language, to do music programming. Very nice. Um, yeah. Very cool. OK, awesome. Um, and so at some point along that road, which is like I guess where we're going to come around to a couple of times today, you caught the JavaScript bug. Um, and I I mean, as you said, have also written like Java and Python, but I, I best know you for your passion for JavaScript. Um, when and how did that happen? So JavaScript was my language when I was going to hackathons. So right. for, the, for the audience, Joe and I met going to hackathons in the UK five years, maybe more than five years ago now. Hackathons <laughs> 2014, I want to say. Well, sorry, hang on. Before that, Space Apps 2013, where yeah. we hacked in teams that sat adjacent to each other, but didn't really interact other than me looking at a cool globe that you'd made. It was like, cool, that I have no idea how the fuck you made that. That's awesome, because I was like a CS student and I was an idiot. Um, and then, yeah, hack from... That. That oh, sorry? I still have the code. In fact, I saw the code for that yesterday. We can try and get that running again, see if it works. Hey, Aaron, thanks for the stream. That'd be fun, yeah. Will it build? Um, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, that yeah. was it, really. I, JavaScript was a quick programming language for me to be able to use APIs and SDKs and right. get stuff built quickly. So right. that Space Apps hack was a great example of the kind of utility I found in JavaScript as a language. So right. um, being able to just sort of make a, a query to an API and then use the result directly in a web page yeah. was great. Um, and you know, in some ways, it's got easier since then. In other ways, it's got more difficult. Um, right. But uh, yeah, I like so things like React and things like Fetch make mm -hmm. make just the speed of, of rapid prototyping a lot faster. Right. Uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, we were, um, I think I told you about this. We had Flacky on the show 
last week, two weeks ago. God, time has flown. Uh, and we looked at Firefox OS, uh, which was like, you know, eight years ago before Fetch, before web work, uh, like service workers, before modules. Um, and just the amount of like weird things they had to do just to, make, you know, like do stuff that now is is taken for granted. And then we got into talking about, you know, like callback hell. And I was recalling um, uh, the first Node.js app I ever, well, I wouldn't even call it an app. The first Node.js hack I did, which was that, um, uh, the, the texting REPL, the like yes, text it has, yeah. Yeah, and the, which was just like one file, which was like 15 callbacks deep. <laughs> because like my first experience, you like trying to use callbacks to call an API. Um, so, I would have thought, so around that time, promises did exist, but they weren't. They were depend like, libraries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was yeah, yeah. Blue, yeah. And Bluebird or something. Yeah. And I can't um, remember what the one we spoke about Flacky was, but yeah, it was like a, and it was like a 200 megabyte library or something. Absurd. It was oh, huge. Wow. Yeah. That's, it was massive. Yeah. It was like the, the promise the promise implementation was bigger than the rest of his code. <laughs> yeah, I would have thought that you would be have, like looking for promises then because you were a super into Haskell, which Well, like, I didn't know that was, that was a thing, right? Like I yeah, yeah. Like, and also like I and Aaron's just joined. Aaron um studied at the same university I did, like at the time, like you didn't in a computer science curriculum learn about APIs. So I'd only learned about APIs at hackathons and no one had told me about promises or that they, they did or didn't exist. Um, so yeah, super cool. Okay, so you started going to a lot of hackathons and one of the things we were talking about was like whether we crack out small hackathon projects, which maybe we'll look at some uh, quadcopter code later. Um, <laughs> but you got very into JavaScript and uh, one of the things that I guess we wanted to talk about was um, you know, like good practices around offering open source projects, maintaining open source projects, particularly related to releases. And I guess a lot of this experience has come both from your work, but also some like projects that, that you work on in, in JavaScript land and open source land. Hmm. Yeah. So um, while I was at university, I wrote this. Um, I worked on a project with some people on my course, yeah. uh, which was called Meta, which is an open source um, audio feature extraction library in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So I uh, the screen up. Yeah, that'll be good. So uh, if you look at this yellow arrow and this little uh, pink arrow, and then this blue arrow up here, um, and while I play the music, you can see that they're sort of jumping around, responding to the, do you hear audio now? We don't. Hang on. So the reason I'm laughing is because user temporary suspended back is is back and thinks it's pre-recorded again. Yes. Sir, no. We are here. User temporary suspended. We are live. Um, yes. Okay. I don't hear audio, but we usually can hear audio through screen share on Streamyard. So I don't know why we can't hear it, but we can see we can see the yeah, the analysis anyway. Yeah. So I, I don't think you need to see the audio for me cool. to to hear the audio for me yeah. to describe what this is doing. So. Right. Um, you can see this pink arrow on the left-hand side, which is sort yeah. of responding up and down to the volume of the music. Cool. Um, this uh, yellow arrow is sort of jumping around generally towards the center-ish and then moving right a bit. Okay. Um, and the blue arrow up at the top is responding to another thing. So I'll pause the music so I can hear sure. what I think, and okay. then <laughs> I'll explain these. So, okay. um, an audio feature is a statistic about uh, a signal, uh, right. an audio signal in particular. So there are um, a group of uh, well-known algorithms and well-known mm -hmm. um, statistics about audio and about signals mm -hmm. that you can use to tell you specific things about the audio. And okay. Meta is a library that um, that implements those algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 they're all sort of handwritten algorithms from mathematicians from the 70s. Sure. They're not like, this isn't new machine learned things. Right. These are implementations of specific well-known algorithms. Right. Well, Which makes sense because, you know, okay. the audio physics hasn't especially changed. There are some fun things you can do with machine learning, okay. though, in particular with unsupervised learning but mm -hmm. I haven't had time to do any of that fun stuff recently. Sure. <laughs> um, the spectral centroid tells you about yeah. the <clears throat> the brightness of a sound, mm -hmm. um, like how how 
bright you might perceive a sand to be, as opposed to like a dull, dark sand. Um, the blue one here, spectral roll-off, tells you yeah. about like, the air of the sand. So um, like it, it, it really tells you about the very high frequency content. Right, um, right. If, there's, if it sounds like open and like it's breathing, I guess, it's hard right. to describe. Yeah, um, it's a but, synesthesia uh, going on here, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there are lots of other feet. Well, not that many, but there are a few other audio features that we implement things like right. uh, we don't need to go through all of these, but like uh, different statistics that tell you um, information about how people are likely to perceive the audio, including things like how much of each note exists in the signal. Right. Um, we do we do different kinds of loudness, but there's this one loudness that is sort of adjusted. So humans hear free, hear different frequencies. How do I? Different frequencies contribute different amounts to how overall loud a person will perceive a sound to be. That so makes sense and explains a lot of you know, my own lived experience. Okay. <laughs> so we have this um, loudness feature, which adjusts yeah. for that basically and tells you right. not like how loud is this signal objectively according right. to physics. It's how loud is this signal subjectively according to average human. The, okay. Interesting. Um, and those sorts of things. So we've had this library now for quite a while. We initially yeah. published it, um, at the end of 2014, and we published yep. a paper about it uh, somewhere. Maybe not. OK, but uh, we did reference? at some point. Oh, no, so that's where you reference to the library. Yeah, it's it should have a link. Oh, there we go, right there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> pointing, oh. pointing at my screen, now, that's a useful thing for me to do. Um, yeah, the web audio conference, right? That's what WAC yeah. said. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so we presented this paper. The, the big question at the time was, is JavaScript fast enough to uh, be able to extract these statistics in real time? Right. So that that means, in particular, um, an audio signal is in in most cases. And yeah, this isn't really true, but like for the sake of argument, there are forty four thousand one hundred numbers per second per second. Yeah, per second. Right, uh, and that's relating to forty-four thousand one hundred hertz. Yes, which is exactly. like a thing that I've seen on things. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So the, yeah, exactly. The sample rate—that's what it right. means. There are this many numbers per second, and the bit depth can can be different. So CD quality audio is forty-four thousand one hundred numbers, and those numbers are sixteen-bit numbers. So okay. they're either sixteen-bit floats or unsigned integers. Like the mm -hmm. encoding doesn't particularly matter, but you have that bit depth and that. So it's really an awful lot of data. Yeah. And writing algorithms that um, that like are performant enough to uh, to ex like to take a chunk of that audio and spit back a number right. uh, while that audio is still being played. Mm. That is um, there's you know it's not um, it's not the craziest sort of performance requirement I've ever had. Right. But it is definitely a, a performance constraint. Uh, right, so right. we were able to show that we could implement at least the set of algorithms that we implemented yeah. to be fast enough. Yeah, I think this graph kind of shows it. It says how yeah. long it takes to extract each one, and right. they're sort of well below yeah. uh, the sort of deadline that they have. Right. Which was great. Um, we did later try to implement some other features that we couldn't get to be fast enough. Uh -huh. uh, and like we got into some really weird, fun things. Like we had to go into the the compiled like um, assembly code that V8 out. I remember that. <laughs> that was that was a tough time. I remember. I remember you trying to explain to me what this like. V8 bytecode was doing. I'm just like, I don't even understand JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, it was something to do with, it was one of the, like, uh, so when you're talking to people about performance, yeah. quite yeah. often they say, like, you don't need to think about the code 
uh, about like you know extracting variables because like right. the interpreter is smart enough that it will figure out that yeah. uh, it doesn't have to and it'll just inline something. In this case, it wasn't. Right. <laughs> um, I was about to say. I remember this is like you found a bug or something, right? But like, I guess yeah. that's what you're getting to. It or weird a bug. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was just. Um, from the code, V8 couldn't be certain that a variable was never going to change, and therefore right. bytecode had to work in a certain way. And that incurred this performance cost that meant our feature extractor couldn't operate quickly enough to be real time, which right. is a problem. So then we had to like, I think we had to inline or we had to move a variable to an outer scope or something. I don't remember exactly what the solution was, but yeah, we've had some fun fun times with this library. That's awesome. Um, but one of the things that we've been doing with this library is <clears throat> maintaining it for five right. years. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, is, it is used by, you know, like some, uh, some popular projects like um, 2XAA's, uh, I can never remember what it's called, Modfi. Modfi. Yeah, this is, you know, open source projects begin with M. I forget all of their names. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, which is a VJing library. Yeah, I I know that there are demos. I know that there's yeah. like an Instagram account, but um, let's see if I just search for Mod V. What do we get? We got virus. Virus. That's not quite uh, what we want. No. Oh well. So it's yeah. a it's cool. Look it up. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a VJing library that musicians and um, particularly chiptune musicians use to make live visuals that respond to the music that they're playing. And they're using Meta to actually get the data from the music to react to in their visuals. So yeah. it's pretty fun. Um, it's been used in a few other things as well. It's not a super widely used project, but like right. there are people who use it and we do get a few, like we get stars sometimes. Yeah, so there's 164 uh, things on the used by thing right there. Where is that now? Oh, that's uh, that's news. <laughs> okay. I'm oh, have... did you not see this before? I so I thought there were like forty or so. That's someone's uh, thesis there. Yeah, yeah, we've had a couple of theses. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Huh. I'm gonna have to go through these. <laughs> I'm two of them, so two. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. using two of these here. But like, yeah, there's there's been a few things. the 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 library itself isn't. Um, the library itself is still usable and it works well. The difference, I guess, right now is that there's a new library that's sort of being released at the moment, which is, um, so to to back up a little, we were trying to like provide these these uh, APIs to JavaScript developers. But right. they had previously been available to like C developers who were doing signal processing and stuff, and Python developers. And they were using libraries like Yafa in Python, Y-I-A-F-E, um, Librosa in Python as well, and Essentia, Essentia, Essentia mm -hmm. in, in C. And now, the Essentia people from uh, the University of Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona have run Inscription on Essent Essentia. Oh, so now you can run the same, like the same code that you might run on your back end in your yeah. front end as well, and it's okay. in um, it's in Wasm WebAssembly, right. so it's right. going to be pretty fast. So. Yeah. Worth definitely checking that one out before you commit to using Meta, but sure. um, Meta still works. And uh, so because I worked as a developer advocate, I decided to work on the documentation of Meta and use it as practice to write pretty good guides. So I would say that we have relatively good documentation. Um, of course, if there's any, if anyone has any issues with the documentation, they should let me know. and. Uh, We'll, we'll try and fix them. But yeah, we have some guides here about how to do, how to use Meta in different use cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have these reference documentation about the specific um, 
uh, interfaces that Meta exposes. Cool. We also have TypeScript types in the definitely typed repo. I should add those to the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there we go. Cool. But um, yeah, so in maintaining the, the repo uh, yeah. has been a lot of the work that we've done has not actually been implementing new features. I kind of thought, you know, we've got this library, it's got some uses, some usage, and therefore we're gonna need to start fielding feature requests, right? Right, right. So we had a few feature requests and we've implemented a few of them and we've accepted contributions from other people. So right. Chroma was actually a, a contribution mm -hmm. uh, from someone else, that was great. Um, but a lot of the work that we've actually done post the initial release has just been um, logistics, I would say, okay. the sort of logistics of package maintenance. Sure. And there's a lot of them. So yeah. uh, that when when the test framework is deprecated, you've got to like right. move your tests over to a new thing. Yeah. When there's a new version of Node released, you've yeah. got to make sure that it right. works. You've right. got to have your continuous integration running, and yeah. one pretty important thing is so um, making sure that your dependencies are up to date. Right. And so this I was just is important. thinking, sorry to interrupt for a moment. I was just thinking that like you, you mentioned like when your test framework is like being replaced or whatever, like just in terms of like open source infrastructure, Mada has been around through like, like using Dependabot, Dependabot got acquired, all the CI died and now it's all GitHub Actions. Like you've lived through like a lot of like big infrastructure changes. Like it's like not non-zero work, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And like in some in some ways it's a strength that we've you know been able to keep up to date with, yeah. with all of this and make sure that the library exposes pretty much the same interface throughout. We're on version five now, so we've made a few breaking changes, but not not hugely significant ones. Like we haven't we certainly haven't redesigned the API from the ground up since twenty fifteen. Right. That means there are some idiosyncrasies to how the API works, but uh, yeah, we've been able to sort of use these tools to make sure that we work in Node and in the browser, that we still we still actually build um, a build to a target which allows people who are not using modern the modern JavaScript ecosystem at all to just pull in a script tag into their right. um, into their HTML page yeah. and use use HTML. like they don't need to be on NPM, they don't need right. to use any of the any of that stuff. Awesome. So that's good. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> we have really. I remember we started off using JS Hint, had to switch to ES Hint. We've been through Gulp, Browserify. I think we still have Browser. Mm, I don't remember how much Browserify we still have here. Uh, Browserify is there in your dependencies. Oh, sorry, the dev yeah. dependencies. Yeah. Huh. Well, we also have Webpack. Yeah. So I wonder why we have both. Maybe I've forgotten to remove one. But um, <clears throat> one of the big things that we've had to do is keep these dependencies up to date. And right. so this is important. Um, it's more important than it seems, I think. Because yeah. so in, in my day to day as a JavaScript developer in an office working on a team working on like production right. code, much less fun, um, <laughs> I um, I sometimes encounter this issue where um, a security vulnerability will be disclosed to NPM, mm -hmm. and it's never one of the the packages that my um, code directly depends on. It's always some transitive dependency five packages mm -hmm. deep. So, right, um, I have to end up going to like um, some other repo somewhere. And asking them, hey, can you like update your thing? And then the next repo, I, hey, can you update your thing? Hey, can you update your thing? Yeah. And that's, you know, in the meantime, we have to make the decision: Are we going to block all releases for our web app, right. or right. are we going to accept that risk uh, for the vulnerability? And like in a lot of cases, the vulnerability is like some irrelevant. Thing in some code path we're not using in some dev right. tool that like doesn't matter that much. So we can. You still need. still something you need to investigate and make the choice on every single time. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's tricky. Um, 
and it's just a lot of effort as well, really. Yeah. So, so it's important to keep your packages up to date because one of the one of the sort of good things about how security vulnerabilities work is that they're not always publicly announced immediately. Right. So quite often, um, when a security um, vulnerability is discovered, the researcher will tell the developer who owns the code that right. has the vulnerability, and they will have some time to fix it. So, so quite often, responsible disclosure and all that kind of yes, thing. Yes, yeah, exactly. So quite often you have a, um, a fix for the bug and a new package published before you even um, right. know, that's like, really know that there's a bug. Yeah. So yeah. if you can keep your code up to date, you're going to always like be on the version of the package that's already packaged or already right. um, patched, yeah. which is great. But in order for that to work, you and all your dependencies need to keep your packages up to date. Right. There, are some, there are some things here where um, I forgot the exact semantic release or semantic versioning syntax, but this little caret symbol here, some packages can say, I work for it every package that's below this major version. Yeah. So when you do an NPM install or a Yarn install, uh, Yarn can actually update dependencies <laughs> of other of your dependencies um, as long as they're not a major version. Yeah. Which is Sorry, I just sneezed good. so hard my headphones fell off there. <laughs> but I, I got the gist, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, keeping stuff up to date. Uh, is important, yeah. and I can explain a little bit about how I approach that from Meta. Yeah, so I think one thing you said there, which will like, is what we're going to get into, but like you mentioned, um, like the concept of semantic version number. I guess that's probably a good place to start for people who haven't encountered Semver before. Yes, oh, um, that's a very Spartan web page. <laughs> I think I've ever actually been here. It's like old Tesco packaging. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's the the official semantic versioning uh, website, and it has translations okay. to loads of different languages. No Irish here. Hmm? Might have to fix that. <laughs> um, so, the the gist of semantic versioning is that you have these three numbers associated with each version of your package. Right. So uh, from left to right, those numbers are major. They're called the major version, the minor version, and the patch version. Mm -hmm. The major version, uh, sorry, OK. So we'll, we'll put you in a situation where you have a package. It's at version 0, 0.00, 0, and you make yeah. a pull request to that package. Right. And you're, you've merged the pull request. It, it does something, and you're ready to release a new version of the package. Right. Now, Semantic versioning is the, the thought process that you use to determine what the version number of your next package should be. And then uh, it also enables the people who consume your package to reason about what that change has, right. has included. So I, I'm going to read the definitions here rather than paraphrase it myself, sure. just in case I get it wrong. Right. So if your change is a backward compatible bug fix, or uh, it doesn't affect the API at all, or it's like a change in the build system that doesn't affect like the behavior of your package, that might be a patch version. Well, you wouldn't actually release a version of the package if you're just changing your build scripts. So that's ir irrelevant. But um, yeah, so when you actually add functionality <clears throat> in a way that is backwards compatible. So like if I was to add a new audio feature to Meta, for example, right. and left all the existing ones as they were, that would be a, a minor version. So you would increment the minor version number. So mm -hmm. currently, Meta is at um, version uh, 4.3.1. It's actually on 5. I, I forgot to push the releases to GitHub. I thought we were here to talk about automating releases today. <laughs> we're on 5.08. Cool. So if I add a new audio feature extractor to Meta, I would yeah. push that in as 5.1.0. Cool. 
by pumping the major version. And then any version that is smaller than the one that you're changing, that yeah. gets reset to zero. When you want to publish a breaking change, so if I wanted to like remove a feature extractor uh, from Meta, I yeah. would uh, bump the major version, which is right. this, this yeah. one here. Yeah. So we've had to do that a few times. We've had to do that to, uh, we've changed the API um, on a few minor points in order to, uh, for compatibility reasons with some, mm -hmm. some edge cases, I guess. <clears throat> um, another one was we added support. This is a fun one. We added support for a new version of Node. This was years ago, and I don't remember which uh, version of Node it was, but the version of Node had included a new version of V8, the JavaScript interpreter that actually right. is beneath Node that's running the JavaScript code. And that interpreter had increased the precision of floating point math. <laughs> And we do a lot of floating point math in yeah. Um, and increasing the precision is not like that's a, a subtle and uh, the only word I can think of is fucky change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so there's a lot of code like this that we have, where you know, yeah. dipping through an array and then doing some multiplication and adding stuff right. together and using log, and um, if you increase the precision, that could affect the results in a right. pretty significant way. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. We, we had to decide, like, if we add support for this version of Node, yeah. is that a breaking change for us? And we decided that it was. And our reasoning yeah. is, um, one thing that you can use Meta for is, if you have, uh, say you are, a musician and you have a yeah. huge library of drum samples. So like right. re very short recordings of hits of, of drums and cymbals and like cups and stuff. Yeah. Um, and you, you want to use it for uh, finding new drum sounds. Right. One thing that you can actually do there is extract the audio features for each recording. So uh -huh. you can get how bright like the, the spectral centroid of each drum hit, how yeah. bright it is, how loud it is, how much spectral roll off there is. There's a thing called spectral kurtosis, which is how pitched is the sound versus right. how like noisy. Um, you might extract these statistics for your entire like 10,000 sample, sample library. Right. Uh, and store them in a database and then use uh, like use um a database lookup thing to say, I want sound that is in the 90th percentile of, of like dark, um, right. so very dark, and I want it to be very unpitched because I'm trying to find like a dark hi hat sound for my audio. If you had run that extraction on your entire library before the change, but now you're querying it based on With features that are extracted yeah. from the new version, you're going to you may, you may end up choosing um, a different sample than you used to used to choose. Right. Uh, so That's you may have to extract all your features again. Yeah. <laughs> so because of that, we decided to break this, and change. Yes, exactly. So so we published a breaking change there. Um, Even though there's no change, well, I mean, the new version of Node, but like no actual changes to the API or the code. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Cool. Well, so there was. There was no change to the code, but there was a change to what we purported to support, right? So right. we said we support this new thing. Um, and one one way to almost think about um, is it a breaking change is does the test suite still pass? Right. And in our case, our test suite did not still pass. So right. we have some tests over here. Um, I guess rely on specific output. For, uh, right. Yeah. So those are some very precise expected values. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So we had all these to equal, and then yeah. and um, the floating point change happened, and it was like off by, you know, point zero 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 one two or something. Right. Right. This this uh, change. So we had to and we had to um, we had to change this somewhere. I'm trying to find an example now. I think maybe 
I don't remember. One of these. So just has a way to assert an approximate equal, right? So you can say like, I expect this thing to be within a precision of this yeah. number. Yeah. Um, and I've had to do that sort of thing a lot with audio because right. it's sort of the nature of audio, really. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so that was a breaking change. Um, but that's not the only kind of change that we've released. We have, we, we try to keep our dependencies up to date so that right. if any of our dependencies or ourselves, but in particular, if any of our dependencies ever have a security vulnerability, we want to already have a published version of Meta that will let our consumers just bump our version, get off the vulnerable yep. version of the, our dependency. Um, so we've set up quite a lot of infrastructure to do this. Yes. And I, I remember hearing you know, about, oh, there's this tool and that tool, and yeah, you can use them. And, do, and it didn't really sound like that big a thing when I started right. out on this. But actually, it's a pretty significant amount of just sort of uh, DevOps infrastructure that you have to sure. put together. Um, and you, uh, we're trying to, like it's, yeah, there's this significant amount of infrastructure you have to put together, and there are lots of weird edge cases. Right. So while I was doing this, I wrote a, a little blog post here. You need to change your the... fabric on, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> Uh, Gatsby. I don't mind people knowing that I tried yeah. out Gatsby. That's fine. I'll probably <laughs> switch to Next.js next week anyway. <laughs> I'm always changing um, which framework I'm using. Right. But um, yeah, so we can go through how this yeah. setup works and then uh, what sort of gotchas exist. Right. So the, the way that our repo is set up right now is that we're expecting each commit message to have a specific uh, format. So you can see here nearly all of these are from Dependabot, actually. But yeah. Dependabot is writing this very specific commit message, which is chore, and then brackets the thing that it's it's a chore about, yeah. and then a space, uh, then a colon and space, and then a specific, like, Here's the thing that is happening. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then there's some, it actually puts more information in, in the body of the commit message. But mm -hmm. that's, that's not actually, mm, that is linted. That is linted. So that's another gotcha. Okay. So um, those commit messages are, you know, every developer has to follow them. Uh, we yeah. have a tool that we use called Committism, which uh, instead of like when you are writing in Meta and you want to make a change, instead yeah. of doing git add and git commit, you do git cz, cz for the Americans. Um, <laughs> we are we are in the American time zone, so we've got a. That's true. We have to be all appropriate. Yeah, we've got we've got to cut all of the U's out of everything. <laughs> yeah, so there's, um, I'll send you the link here so that you can, I'll just paste this into the chat myself, actually. Yeah, you are um, a VIP. My chat is not working. That's fun. Huh. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's this tool, Committism, which you can install uh, for your repo, which will yeah. enable this git cz cz uh, command, which gives you like a wizard, and it'll prompt you what type of change are you committing? So you'll see it come around here in the GIF, and you, it like selects a feature. You write in the scope, which is the thing in the brackets, and then you write the right. more stuff about it. Um, it also asks you, is this a breaking change? Which is, should I bump the major version? Yeah. You can say yes or no, um, and it'll ask you if something else. I'm just waiting for it to come through. Uh, yeah, you can write the body there. It also asks you, is this related to a GitHub issue? So you can tie your commits to GitHub issues. Uh, and it's configurable, but this yeah. format enables a second tool uh, called semantic release to run. So semantic release is um, <clears throat> a tool that runs in CI, 
we use Travis CI because we have used it for a long time, but we just add this line, yep. run semantic release mm -hmm. in, um, in our CI. And that, if it's a, a build of the main branch, it'll, yep. it'll like analyze the commit messages and it'll actually publish um, a, a uh, new version of the package to Meta. It'll automatically, or sorry, to NPM. It'll automatically incre increment the correct version. So That's awesome. it's all sort of handled for you. It's, yeah. it's, it's great in that it's, um, it, it makes things easier. And like one big argument for it is this idea of unsentimental releases. Yes, so, which I'm glad we came on to because I've been itching yeah. to talk about that. This is really important. Yeah. It's, yeah. So unsentimental releases are when uh, you, as a developer, you write the code. You don't think about, is this going to release a new major version of my package? Right. Yeah. You just write the code, and you yeah. merge it, and your yeah. CI releases it with yeah. the correct package version. Yeah. 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 Um, it really helped me get over this thing that I used to have, which was, you know, we always ended up with so, so many open PRs. And I was right. saying, yep, it's great. And we'll merge it when we're doing a major version. Right. <laughs> um, because, you know, this API change or whatever, or like, oh, we, we want to batch results together. We don't want to do too much, too many yeah. publishes. But actually, that doesn't, um, the idea behind unsentimental release at least as I understand it, and I'm yeah. interested to hear your perspective too, is that your your consumers, you're like the users of your library are actually less well served by right. having code that's written that's waiting for release. They're actually better served having to make small uh, upgrades for breaking right. changes in the short term. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's and, very similar to what I answered. Sorry, go ahead. So it also doesn't preclude you from publishing backports. Like that's a, an important thing. So if you have a consumer who cannot do a major version upgrade for some reason, yep. you're still able to take any new feature and backport it to your previous right. major version series and release right. it in French. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's all about people. Like every computer yeah. thing, it's all about yeah. people. It, for me, it helped me get over this sort of preconceived notion that you know every release has to be big. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's the concept. The reason I'm, I, I really like this concept is the concept, the context under which I first heard about it was from Zeke at GitHub about Electron 2.0 and about how for a long time, elect, basically in a similar position, like the team were very caught up on like, oh, Electron 2.0. Because like even before, so like even if you're practicing semantic versioning, like there's even a step before that where for like a lot of people, like the 1.0 isn't just like, oh, hey, this is our first major version or like this is the first time the API is stabilized. It's like, oh, this is the release. This is prime time. This is when we're ready. And like there's a perception every time you bump the major version, it's not just like you're breaking API change, but like almost like a vision change, right? Or like mm -hmm. it needs to be some big philosophical thing or like a certain amount of progress um and i remember zeke talking about that at github satellite la um and that mm -hmm. being the first time i encountered the term um yeah i think you're you're exactly right in that like that detachment from like the progress of the project to the version number um is ultimately like a, a huge unlocking function and removes a lot of fear and actually i also like the approach this is going whether well, like the direction you're going with this but just like as a human you actually don't interface with the versioning process at all in any way it just happens around you because i think that's a big psychological safety net <laughs> absolutely so that's a great way to think about it like removing yourself from the versioning process right. because yeah. it enables the computers to do loads of thinking for you right. so it enables things like dependabot to know is this a major version or not it enables your CI to know, like, it, you, you could make a rule on your CI to automatically merge a pull request if right. it's from Dependabot, if it's bumping a non-major version, and if all the tests pass. You can just yeah. decide, I don't want to have to deal with that stuff. Yeah. I want the computers to deal with that. Um, and in some work projects, we actually do that. Um, yeah. So the <laughs> you were saying about the... Um, the major version 
being such a huge sort of monumental thing. I remember um, someone we know who organizes events uh, in the UK um, around the time when we were working on Meta um, saying that like, oh, we can't use Node in production yet because it's not released. And this was back when it was on sort of the 0 0.8 or 0 .0, 0 yeah. .8 and 0 0.10 and 0 0.12 right. theories, right. while the whole IOJS shizzle yeah. was happening. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And also, while many major companies, including I think PayPal at the time, had Node in production. Yeah, that would have, that would have been well after the whole like the whole. So for those of you who don't know the 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 context of what we're talking about here, PayPal had a really big public thing where they hired. I think it's Bill Bill O'Reilly. Uh, they hired some. They hired someone from Netflix who was famous for building out Netflix's like infrastructure on Node.js, and they told all of the Java developers in PayPal to retrain in JavaScript or to leave. <laughs> Oh wow, that sounds yeah. terrible. That sounds yeah. really bad. And then, the, and then this is also the other cool thing. I don't know if it's still around. Actually, I need to have a look. Uh, PayPal basically at the time decided that, and this was again like I said before, like quite early, early in Node.js. Um, but they decided that the paper, the the Node.js web ecosystem was not. Um, vigorous or secure enough and there was still a lot of like uh cracks and like things that weren't being taken care of and internet internationalization wasn't solved and various security aspects weren't solved so they is made what's java called developers saying this this is just paypal as a whole oh, yeah okay. probably but they made what was called kraken there we go my chat's now working again they made kraken which is basically like a framework on top of well a collection of projects on top of node.js express to like enterpriseify uh node.js basically um, I don't know if it's still maintained. It doesn't have a HTTP cert, so I'm HTTPS cert, so I'm assuming it's not. Um, I guess no, no longer, alas. Yeah. Um, was, yeah. Anyway, that was a fun trip down memory lane. So yeah, big projects were using it, and like this person thought it wasn't released because it didn't have a major version number, basically. Yeah, absolutely. What what you were saying as well about um, you know trying to get big groups of people to retrain in tech, yeah. like that that uh, hits home. So I work at a company where. In the early days of my time at this company, um, we had very sort of strict language rules, mm -hmm. and all of the backend was written in Java, and it still yeah. is mostly. Um, right. But we weren't allowed to do any Node at the time, and now we do have some server-side rendering stuff, and we yeah. write GraphQL servers in Node because some people tried to write it in Java, and that was a terrible move. So. Right. 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 Um, <laughs> So we're writing GraphQL servers in Node. But yeah, I could totally see them saying, like, if that attitude that they had back then was around now, I yeah. could definitely see them saying, oh, well, now we have WebAssembly. So we're going to have to find a WebAssembly okay. implementation of the Java runtime and yeah. write all our front end code in Java. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually just like, I'm finding blog posts about this. They were really vocal about it um, from the right. PayPal engineering blog on Medium. So they published uh, an initial blog about like the move to, it was, it was huge news. Um, I guess like they must be one of the first big companies to do this. Um, but they wrote an initial blog about it. And then like a couple little while later, they put on this other one, which was like, we're desperately trying to hire all the Node.js application engineers that exist to come write Kraken. Um, <laughs> it's like they're redesigning everything. For Node.js, not like it made decision last year to write all of our new applications on Node.js and just like, mm. yeah, wow, well, yeah, oh, what a time! And then the secular tailwinds changed. Um, <laughs> I have to, I have to find that. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Um, oh my god. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a total tangent, but we're going to go there. Tech CEOs. They they like the sound of their old voice, their own voices. Um, there's a conference called Davos, which is basically all the rich people in the world go up a, a Swiss mountain. Um, and there was an amazing God, which one? Which year? Was that been 2017? No, 2016. I believe. Um, there's this amazing interview with PayPal president and CEO Dan Shulman at Davos where he's talking about something very important, I'm sure. Um, and he won't stop talking about secular tailwinds. 
<laughs> and I have to find it because it's absolute nonsense. But just like to this day, I'm haunted by the phrase "secular tailwinds." <laughs> I think I found it. Yeah, it was about, it was about break. It was about breaking up PayPal and eBay. There you go. Sorry, yeah, not that one. Have some have some secular tailwinds, and I still don't know what secular tailwinds is meant to mean. <laughs> but I heard a CEO say it recently as well. Anyway, total. Tangent. It's like um, corporate speak. It's like synergy yeah. or using the word invite as a noun, that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Garbage. Anyway, um, sorry about that. <clears throat> so just to get back into the, the sort of semantic release and getting into some of these sort of pitfalls that I encountered. Um, so uh, there are a couple of things that you really have to get right when you're doing semantic release. And all of these bit me in the ass while I was trying to set all of this up. So right. um, I'm uh, going to try and share these now. So Perfect. you can get into a state in your repository where you've merged an unreleased commit that doesn't follow the commit standard, okay. message standard. And so therefore, semantic release won't know what to do with it. So there are. Um, a couple of things you can do. You can rewrite the, the Git history, which is tricky if it's a big project that lots of people have cloned. Because right. if you rewrite the history, then p there's going to be invalid state between the repos on different people's computers. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also manually publish that commit. Um, and so then semantic release doesn't need to think about it anymore. I had. Um, an issue where this happened, and um, what did I do? Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, so an empty the, commit. Okay. Yeah, I published an em empty commit with the correct changes. So this mm -hmm. actually, I think, was a commit on Meta where right. I needed to add support for Node 13 and 14 and drop node support for Node 8. I think I had manually merged something that, that didn't work. So then uh, I merged this major change. And now there were no breaking changes in GitHub that were not in um, the release. So that right. was great. Cool. So another tricky issue <laughs> was GitHub has this feature called squash merge, which is really useful for when you have a pull request that has multiple commits in. And I use that feature a lot because I try to keep my commits small. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah, I try to keep my commits small, but also quite often I just commit stuff and then realize, oh, I made a typo, make another commit, which is just called typo. Right. <laughs> because I know that GitHub will let me squash Just make that all go away. Yeah. One thing that GitHub does when it squashes is that it appends the PR number to your commit message. Right. That's a problem because semantic release enforces a maximum line length on the header. Okay. So if you have a commit message that already is 99 characters long, and then GitHub adds these five more characters, six more right. characters, then it pushes it over the limit and semantic release. Do you know why semantic release has that limit? Um, so, I mean, it, it's it's definitely considered good practice to have short commit message right. titles because the details should be in your sure. um, in your body. I have definitely encountered issues where that's just not. It's it's yeah. There's no meaningful way to describe the change that you're making in such a right. in less yeah. than a tweet. And it seems like a weird. I mean, like, good practice is good practice, but like, this is almost to like the, I guess, like Go format and like opinionated formatting tools kind of things, where it's like, at what point does Go good does good practice actually just become you know like a compiler mm. error? <laughs> well, so, like, so one good reason is because quite often you actually have to list commits. So there's this GitHub view. And in, yeah. in a GitHub window, I mean, you have some, really have a lot longer there, right? But in an 80-column um, 80, 80 terminal. Like. Yes, exactly. It, so Git log is very useful. And they're trying to preserve the utility of Git log through right. enforcing this limit. Yeah. It just seems um, like not the place. It doesn't seem like that is the tool, the part in the tool chain that should be enforcing that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah for sure. 
Um, also, I had an issue just recently where, so we, we keep our docs in the repo in a separate package that also gets updated by Dependabot, which I'll come to soon. But um, because it has this prefix and the package yeah. name, two version numbers, and it has this additional in docs part, yeah. that quite often is enough to push um, certain packages over the limit. Right. Uh, like I, I suppose there are some packages where if they're bumping from like 4.9.2 to 4.10.2, it can be that one extra character because of the double digit number that would make the, the What do you do difference. at that point? Because it needs that format. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that's just a tricky, a tricky one. Like yeah. you could manually bump that, that package. You could also um, modify the format. So one that I did have recently that I did just modify the format was there was a link in the body of a message and the body also had a width limit too. Um, but the link was longer than a hundred lines, a hundred characters long. Right. So I just made a rule in our package JSON. So it is configurable. A lot of this. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. I said, Always no, there are a thousand yeah. lines. <laughs> nice. So that's fine. I think if it's the body of the commit message, I, I don't. Yeah, think body, it. body is free territory. Yeah. Um, so I had another issue, which was where Dependabot wasn't writing the commit messages properly. So Dependabot will automatically decide how to write its commit messages based on the existing recent commit messages in your repository. Um, which cool. means that, yeah, it's great that it can just auto detect and see like, oh, if this is an already valid conventional commit, uh, I'll just follow the convention too. And then depend about automatically fits in with your whole semantic release um, configuration already, which is great. Problem is if you're adding semantic release and depend about at the same time <laughs> and, right. and it detects that the you're not thing. using, yeah, it, it if it sees a repo that doesn't already have semantic release commits or yeah. conventional uh, commits in there, it'll decide, OK, I'm going to go readable, like human readable, rather than um, following the convention. Right. Or it'll say, I'm going to follow the convention, which is human readable. Human readable. Yeah. So uh, they have a specific commit message that you can, or they have a property, excuse me, in the configuration of Dependabot, uh, where you can specifically tell it, hey, use conventional commits. Cool. Um, when I was first installing Dependabot and semantic release and commit is in, on Meta, yeah. I had this issue where I installed Dependabot first. Right. <laughs> so I was getting the wrong types of commits. And then I was yeah. like, oh, but how am I going to get it to update the title of these existing commits? Yeah. I just did it manually. That is, I can see why you described this as like, you know, unexpected problems that bite you in the ass. Cause like the order, like deterministic bot installation ordering is not something you anticipate, right? Yeah, it, it is definitely, it was trickier than yeah. I expected. I would mm -hmm. say that. Um, and it was these like weird, just order issues or whatever. Yeah. Um, another tool, which is in the list of tools that is in this whole setup is commit lint. Right. Um, so that is there to fail a PR based on the, the commit title rather than let it be mergeable and then end up in a state where you have incorrect. Right. Cool. That's again, making sure that the commit is in the format that semantic release needs. Exactly. But at a different place in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's in the the review. Right. So I semantic release will fail to release. Uh, yes, here's the, here's the specific problem. So okay. if you have a commit that you've merged and the commit doesn't have the right um, like title, Semantic release will treat it as irrelevant and it will not yeah. release the commit. So you'll end up with this code that isn't, it doesn't get released. So right. um, it doesn't fail, it just doesn't release the code. And that's why up here you had to, you had to make um, 
a separate dummy commit, like an empty commit, to make it do the release. Yeah. Whereas commit lint will make sure that the commits are properly formatted so that they're parsable by semantic release. And of course, semantic release doesn't run, like it doesn't do a release in review. It only does a release in the master build. Right. So there are, there are situations where you can encounter things that happen only in the master build when it tries to release. Okay. Um, Makes sense. So that's why commit lint is there in the in the review build to make sure that the PR is actually good. Uh, right. Commit messages right there before you merge. Yeah. It's important. Um, now this last one I'm super interested in. The reason I'm interested in this last one, uh, I'm part of a project. I don't think anyone from that project. Um, yes, uh, Hugh, can you post this link in the chat? This yes. the link to your blog post. Um, yeah, Shreyas, yeah. we've got it coming for you. Um, so the, um, apart from project, I don't think anyone from that project's in here, where we recently basically had an issue with just like uh, trying to come up with some commit standard, not for like automated tooling like this, but just from the fact that, you know, commits were unruly and people had opinions about how they should look. Um, and the maintainer came up with a really good and really rigorous and really useful um commit standard and like, I think the goal of that commit standard like a big goal of that commit standard was basically to um we're very reliant on in that project on on certain github tooling so like we have a very rigorous labeling system and these kind of things and our issues um mm. and if we ever want to move away from github uh, we recently did this tomfoolery where we moved the project from one repo to another and that okay. kind of exposed the fragility of this like label system and so they wanted to bring some of that power to like the the label searching and that kind of thing into basically git logs and git okay. history so they could do it yeah. there um and it, that that basically just like completely died and like never went anywhere in part because the overhead for people writing commits on like having to manually follow lengthy commit conventions um Absolutely. so i'm very excited to hear this bit yeah so um i'm sorry to say that i don't have a magic way to solve that problem um, in any progress yeah way. so it it is it is tricky and like Right. One of the big things that I was worried, worried about setting this up at all was that right. would it discourage people from um, contributing to my right. repos? Right. And um, I have not really found that it does. Having said that, Meta is not React. We're not, you know, getting random PRs from people every day. We've had like- but if, any, if anything, that's like more significant, right? Cause like React is like a project that I guess is like, has a strong enough orbit that people will jump through whatever hoop to commit. For sure. And in fact they do like to contribute to React, you have to sign, or at least at one point you had to sign Facebook's right. legal, whatever, like handing over- C CLA. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, that thing. Um, so yeah, you have to um, sort of strike the balance really. Um, so one, like the, the primary thing that you have to do is make yourself as a maintainer available for feedback and for, um, for helping people, right? Because people will find it tricky. A lot of people are coming to open source specifically to learn. And I speaking for myself only, and not trying to get into a like weird hacker news controversy. I. <laughs> would like to do my part to try and help people have a positive experience and try and learn what they can um, in contributing to open source. So primarily it's about being responsive to issues and to requests that come up, making sure that people know how they can contact you. You don't have to, um, th this is easy for me because I have such a low traffic repository, really. It's not, right. um, I'm not someone like Sindrosaurus. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce words that I've only read on the internet ever, or yeah. Subsack, or... Pro pro prolific pro Node.js man, Sindri Horus. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so if I were them, I would have a much more difficult time, but like because I am able to make the time, um, yeah. I think it's like, I think because I'm able to make the time, I therefore feel like a uh, semantic release is probably worth it. And in fact, semantic release frees up my time so that I am able to spend more of it on helping people yeah. out, which is great. Um, there are a few tools that you can also use. 
So I mentioned Committism. <clears throat> um, Committism is good because you can install it in your project and then the command will be available to anyone who has cloned your project and run an NPM install. We use NPM rather than Yarn and Matic because we're right. old. Um, and it'll give them this wizard. They can fill in the wizard and commit there. So that's great. Um, right. There's also uh, Husky, which is another tool that we use to run um, ESLint on commit. So we make sure that people are mm, prettier, maybe prettier, I think prettier. It'll run prettier, so it'll auto format the code on commit so that people don't have to worry about like the coding conventions or whatever. Like back when we started, it was actually before prettier was a thing. So I was even reluctant to put a a linter in because I felt that getting contributions at all was better than having people um, drop off because they were integrated with a, a committer, um, a linter configuration. Sure. So prettier was a great thing to help us for that. Um, and also, if you're um, a, if you get a commit and it fails, you know the code is still there. Yeah. You're able to say, hey, here's how to fix it. But if you don't want to, I'm happy to take your code and merge it in and add you in properly as a co-author oh, commit. Yeah. yeah. So that's an important part. Let's see cool. if I said anything else here. So wrap committism and commit lint and script. Oh, these are things that I would do. Yeah, it might be worth to go through these. So yeah, uh, things that I would do, but I haven't done yet. And I don't think sure. I've done them subsequently. So um, wrap committism and commit lint and scripts so that we can customize them and improve the error messages. We actually do this a lot at work. In, in right. the repo that I have at work, instead of calling the tools directly, we will wrap them in something so that we can intercept what they're doing and present the error or present like the interface to the user in the way that we want to or like hook into something. Interesting. OK. It's uh, it's kind of like React scripts. So uh, where React scripts wraps Webpack, I, mm -hmm. I think, um, or where Next.js wraps uh, wraps Webpack to provide a better user experience. Whichever framework is below Next.js and the never-ending pile of frameworks that is, <laughs> that is that project. Yeah, I think Babel's in there somewhere. Uh, yeah. I, don't know. Um, I mean, I assume it just sort of has all the frameworks. Uh, I don't know. It's yeah. that's a fun one. But yeah, um, improving the error messages a bit would be good. Um, having a GitHub bot to like say, hi, the commit message that you wrote isn't uh, according to our standard. Right. Would you like to try this commit? And even yeah. having a bot where you can just click a link and it will like automatically go and yeah. modify the commit. Yeah. And that that's at that point is like when you've got the PR and it's got a, a commit that doesn't perform standard. That's where the yeah. fix to just add a blank commit with the correct message comes in right into that straight into that PR. Very easy. That, right. that would be great if that yeah. was possible. I just haven't done that. Um, Oh, sorry, Shreyas, you got banned for links. Shreyas, you come to this stream every day. How are you still not <laughs> aware of the bot? <laughs> I I have got hit by the bot a couple of times. I know. Uh, um, <laughs> here you go, Shreyas. I'll, I'll permit you to post that link. Um, cool. There you go. There you go. Um, information in the GitHub pull request template. OK, yeah, that's. That's, yeah. uh, uh, why are you talking about that? Um, I've seen your question user temporarily suspended. Um, we'll chat about that uh, in, a, in a little bit once we finish with this. Yeah, I noticed there were a few questions that we should um, yeah. we should get back to throughout that sure. we kind of didn't go through. Um, let's see. There was make depend upon red commits. Make sure your CI won't be blocked from deploying to the registry. So yeah, make sure that I had this situation where I had set up all of this stuff and semantic release tried to do a release, but then it didn't have a NPM token. So it wasn't actually able to deploy the code. Um, so you have to make sure that you provide your NPM token to the tool to semantic release in continuous integration so that it's able to do the release. Mm. And then the most important one is cool. 
this whole blog post, all of these points are, um, I, I ran into all of these issues. <laughs> and now Meta is running fine. It, it runs, it works, right. it's good. Um, yeah. It has semantic release. I was able to work through all the problems. Hopefully, this blog post will help people get around yeah. the problems, or hopefully, they'll come to it when they Google for the problems. Um, and uh, yeah, to, but, yeah. To, but maybe, don't worry. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. The computers yeah. will, will, uh, it, yeah. will figure it out. And I guess yeah. to, clo to close the loop on this, as I said, uh, Gregor showed us semantic release a little bit. Uh, last week when talking about OctoKit, which you know is one of those like huge projects that gets like a bucket ton of of, of um, contributors, it being the official yeah. GitHub APIs, and they use semantic release on there. And I would not be surprised. Well, I mean, they they must have run into all these things, right? We actually he showed us he made a he did a live pull request on the show and was going through like the go like doing the format in the commit and someone even asked like what do you put in brackets and stuff if you're doing this mm. um so they have all the same issues so like this is applicable to projects of all of all shapes and sizes absolutely um, yeah it's definitely something you can add into bigger projects yeah um if the thing that i would want to do and Craig does this really well because i've actually contributed to octokit and he helped oh, nice. with that is help the contributors right deal with it this isn't yes. something that you know they teach at every university or yeah. this right. isn't something this definitely isn't something that every javascript shop does yeah. or every javascript developer sort yeah. of expects yeah, yeah. or yeah. you know it right. of course works for other languages but i'm specifically right. focusing yeah. on JavaScript. but then the, a point that gregor stopped and belabored in the stream was that like he is able to provide that welcome experience because he's paid to contribute to OctoKit, which is like, right. if you're working on an open source project like Mada, these are some great tips to get to that level of automation, which you need to remain, you know, able yeah. to work on the project. Um, For sure. Super cool. So let's go back. So there's a couple of questions that we yeah. have to revisit that we saved. Uh, so the first one, um, which is a good college? Which university did you go to? Um, you answered that a little bit at the beginning, but we can hmm. revisit that briefly. Yeah, so I went to Goldsmiths, which is a university in London. Um, I studied, uh, I studied, I think three different courses throughout my time. I switched like depending on. So, I guess in America that translates to like which major. I guess I switched major several times. University right. is a very different thing in in uh, in the UK, UK to too. America and the UK to everywhere else. I guess really. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, I, I did music computing for a long time, uh, a BMUS thing rather than a BSc, and then I right. switched over to creative computing, and I got I got halfway through a master's course, <laughs> which was um, sort of music tech research stuff before I dropped out and and uh, got my well. Uh, I didn't officially drop out. I like with you downgraded to like the diploma, right? Thing. Yeah. I I don't. So it was an integrated masters. I don't. Yeah. I downgraded from graduating with an integrated masters to graduating with a bachelor's degree. Right. Cool. So, which um, if you're not in the UK, the, the concept of an integrated masters. This is just yeah. a UK specific student finance scam. Okay, it's you don't have to worry about it. It's very good, <laughs> um, yeah. and I kind of wish I had finished. But <laughs> um, yeah, it was great. It was. Uh, I've had a few times in my career where, you know, I have done something like because I needed to hack through something and get it to work or whatever, yeah. and I've had some haughty manager say to me, "Hugh." I would expect better from a computer science graduate. And I've been able to say, well, you should have hired a computer science graduate then because I studied music computing. <laughs> so it's great because um, it's like a, you know, it, for me, I would have found it difficult, I think, to, yeah. to just do like algorithms and data structures and programming right. language theory all the time. I actually really enjoyed having a specific domain to think about right. that stuff. Right, for sure. Yeah, 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 which is um, we actually got into this a little bit with Sarah Guffles yesterday. Um, so Sarah works on a lot of educational content at Microsoft, and the big part of her focus is on people who like aren't 
like basically her, like one of her points was like we make a lot of computing educational materials assuming that like a career in tech or an interest in tech is the end goal not like an interest in a domain and so yeah. she's like doing a lot of materials like like they just launched a course on microsoft learn which is like a tie-in with the new wonder woman movie um <laughs> just like do like hey you have other interests and also here's a way you can use computing in those and like it's not the end goal which i think is like a really uh, a really interesting point. Yeah. Um, and Shreya asked the question. Sorry, go ahead. It's important to like think about other people's goals. Like this book yeah. we mentioned earlier. This is yeah. all about which I bought <laughs> on <Shreya. laughs> This is all about thinking about how you apply the tools yeah. to to a domain and to like art and creativity. So yeah, right. super important. Another thing is like when I was a developer advocate. You know, one of the so when you're a developer advocate, you have to think about your your target audience a lot, and we think yeah. about like the specific segments of developers. So you could think of like really um, advanced uh, senior enterprise developers, right? Right. Right. Java all the time, and you know that sort of archetype. Um, and you can, or you can think about like beginner Ruby developers who right. are in this location and have that thing. And you can think of lots of very computer science specific yeah. segments. But one of the really interesting things, because I was doing <clears throat> developer relations for a company that does that is related to music, and one of the great things that we were able to think about was, you know, what if the primary focus was on you know, people who are interested in music, how right. can these tools be useful for artists and how can we make yeah. the, this API useful for like musicians or yeah. for fans? Right. I am a big fan of the musician Carly Rae Jepsen, who you saw featured in my profile photo at the start and presumably yeah. at the end of the screen. And I used the API to, um, to build a website that would, uh, like it was, I guess people have seen these like is it Christmas yet dot com websites right. that are that say no for this whole time and then yes for a little bit of the year. Yeah. I did one of those to automatically uh, turn to like yes when uh, Carly Jepsen's fourth album was released. Right, so that was, that was the album that so, was very long overdue. That one. Ah, yes, that one. They're very good. Listen, listen yeah. to Carly Rae Jepsen. But yeah, I never, you know, I never realized. You probably told me somewhat. I never realized that's that Carly Rae Jepsen in that photo. I just opened it up to have a look. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep, Stockholm, twenty nineteen. I guess. Mm. Very good. Yeah, twenty nineteen. Very good. Um, that's tangent. I was going to go on that comment. Was um, Shreyas asked us earlier, and I think the bot. I, for some reason, I think the bot went back and deleted his historical messages as well. Oh, um, oh yeah, Shreyas. Well, sorry. Yeah, I can see it says six messages were deleted. Um, but Shreyas asked, um, which you may or may not be able to answer. I'm pretty sure you've dabbled in this. Um, what you use to write uh, GraphQL API clients with the Node.js? I think that was the question. Shreyas, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, to write so uh, to write clients in Node.js. So check. It should actually Streamyard should have kept it. Let me see if I can find oh, yeah. it. Ah, here we go. What libraries do you use to write your GraphQL API in Node? So no, it's completely wrong. So the server side. In the server the side. Address. Yeah. You know, I'm not fully sure. I should cool. know this, but I don't remember specifically. I think it's Apollo, uh, which is Facebook's GraphQL yeah. library, I think. Um, but totally we fine. We wrap stuff in. We, we tend to wrap our libraries in. Uh, I, th I think we have a central internal library that we're using that wraps Apollo, probably. Okay. Yeah. Again, we, we've spoken about PayPal and Crack and JS today. Big companies love to wrap stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we never use anything yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, that's what I was going to say on this tangent. So, uh, sorry, I'll go back to the, the GraphQL stuff in a sec, but just before I forget, um, you were talking about you know music and what about people who want to code music and not actually interested in like you know the internet of a library um we have the same thing in games so i do a lot of work with games companies and it's like the exact same thing where like to a lot of games developers actually the code the fact they have to use code to write games is like 
completely incidental and is an inconvenience and a fact of life. And they are not at all interested in really becoming... I mean, there are games developers that are interested in becoming good developers, obviously. Yeah. But the vast bulk of them just want to write a game and they don't care. Um, and so, yeah, we see that kind of similar thing a lot in the game stuff. Um, yeah, for sure. That's yeah. It's like using code to enable creativity is a recurring theme here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then my other answer to Shreyas. Uh, Shreyas, if you go back on our Twitch page into the videos, you will find a video with Ender Phelan. Is that the correct pronunciation of Phelan? Phelan. Phelan. Damn it. My I Irish, think, my no. Irish uh, pronunciation coach. Um, <laughs> where we talk about GraphBack, which is a framework for writing GraphQL apps and also provides a server. Mm -hmm. um, so that'd be a really good one. It, we, he explained GraphQL really thoroughly, spoke about a lot of projects in the ecosystem. So that will be a really good project to check out. Uh, I will do more than that for you, Shreyas. I will go and find the actual stream for you. Um, While you're doing that, I'll correct myself and say that Apollo is not Facebook's thing. I remember now it's a a separate company that builds GraphQL tooling, and there's the link for Apollo. Yes. Um, cool. So we are running close on time. Um, mm. We did have a plan to fly by your synthesizer. Do you want to briefly show that before we log off? Yeah. So I'm not sure exactly how useful this will be at this point, because we sure. don't have that much time. But um, uh, I think it was over here. Yeah. So I have started working on a Next.js project at work. And mm -hmm. so I've needed to get more familiar with Next.js recently. Right. And I've also been thinking about, uh, so I also do a lot of stuff with web audio. So I, I, we didn't say it, but Meta has a web audio integration, which will let you right. extract audio features on web audio um, streams as they're running. So that's the real time part that I was referring to. It also exposes the functions directly, so you can just run it on whatever signal you have. Mm -hmm. But um, it's important to think about how does the interface to um, like this interactive code work in something like React, where right. you're hoping that your functions are ideally pure functions as much as possible, and that they wrap effects nicely in use effect, the use effect React hook, um, that they're not, this is not an MVP, MVC yeah. situation here. You're not yeah, like yeah. keeping tools around. You're not doing two-way data binding in the way that you know Angular used to. You are hoping to have hooks. So um, I decided I needed to make a synthesizer hook yeah. Which would, it was use synth, and it would give you back a synthesizer that you can like hook up to your UI in React. Mm -hmm. um, the synthesizer was implemented in, uh, in web audio. So that oh. was fun. The, the fun, like tricky bit here is that because it's Next.js, yeah. it does serve. So Next.js helps with, with uh, static site generation and right. also server-side rendering. So those are distinct okay. in that static site generation happens at build time, and it mm -hmm. pre-renders out pages. So if you have a blog, it might render out the HTML for each blog page, mm -hmm. each blog post. Then uh, there's also the server-side rendering, which is that when a request comes in to your yeah. Next.js process, it'll build the response on the server, like how PHP used to do things. Right. The problem here is that web audio is not available on the server. It'll throw you an error if you, ah, oh, I have a beard like Gimli. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's quarantine. I've decided that if the world yeah. doesn't let me go out and see people, I'm going to have a beard like Harry. We, we get a lot of hair and beard related comments <laughs> in the stream. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I needed to make make um, it such that it would render, or like it wouldn't throw an error in the server while it's rendering the, the synthesizer. I think there's also a few other fun, like 
bits and pieces here, like yeah. where I could pre-render. I could have the um, state in the uh, in the URL, the state of the synthesizer, and have that pre-render like widgets with right. the correct values in there. So synthesizers, synthesizers look great. Um, they are these huge panels usually yeah. where you have loads of buttons and they are like the quint buttons. quintessential like retro futurist yeah. technology they're great it's like you know computers from the 60s so they're just big block boxes with led yeah. switches yeah out. they're very good um and so if you have a, a synthesizer that is like this um you may want to have it like pre-render the UI in the correct state rather than have the UI load and be then have to like animate to the right place or something and you know have it out of sync with the audio and yeah, all sorts. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you could do with server-side rendering. Um, cool. I can show the use synth hook, I guess. Uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot to show one part of, of Dependabot, which I'll show after this very quickly. Sure. So um, you can see in this component here, this page, index.js, my next page, yeah. I have synth equals use synth, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is fun. Um, it's just a React hook. It's just a custom React hook. Uh, it'll do, it'll check if the synth is loaded. It'll, yeah. if not, it'll return this stuff. So this also handles the server-side render case. Um, the synth won't load on the server. Therefore, you'll end up with uh, this loading UI. Otherwise, it'll return the synthesizer on the, the client. One thing that people don't think about, and Josh Camille has a great blog post about this, is that the first render after a load when your page has been server-side rendered or, or static site generated, it has to return the same exact DOM that it returned mm -hmm. on the server side. So that means that even if like, oh, now we have access to the window API, therefore we right. are able to instantiate our synthesizer, that's actually not what the, the code is expecting. The, the React rehydration is expecting you to generate the exact same thing, and then in subsequent renders, do right, it. you can change it. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So I had to handle that in the way that um, Josh recommends yeah. over here in my use synth file, right. where um, you have to have a use state which starts out being false, and then inside a use effect, you have to set that to be true. Mm -hmm and return it. So it always starts out in the initial render. It's always false. And then yeah. only in subsequent renders. I guess like initialized yeah. and passed back. That reminds, yeah. me of, um, that reminds me of like the old like is like window ready event or whatever it was. Yeah. Dom document dom, dom, yeah. dom content loaded or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, huh. that was good. Oh yeah, and the the jQuery like dollar dot ready thing. Yeah. Ah, oh, jQuery. Those were the days. It's come up a lot. I feel I feel like we just need to do like a whole show on jQuery because like everyone on the sh everyone on the show is like jQuery nostalgia. We're gonna do there's two things: jQuery nostalgia and like writing PHP on like a C panel instance oh. and just like running oh. it in line HTML. <laughs> like, that's the two things that come up time. Oh. And I remember them and MySQL, PHP, my admin as well. Oh, that that whole thing that was great. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, Co Co we'll, we'll wrap up now. But um, yeah. Cody J Robot just came and said there really seems to be quite a difference in viewers compared to the pterodactyl stream. Yes, Cody J Robot, that's what happens when you have a project with eight thousand people in its Discord rock, rock up and at everyone in the Discord, which results in me freaking out. <laughs> this was normally very chill. That day was not chill. I'm, um, I'm completely happy with the chill, I have to say. <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's been great. We've had a lot of interaction. It's been lovely. Um, so do you want to show us the Dependabot thing? Yes. The thing with installing Dependabot on your repositories is that you end up with GitHub notifications that look like this. You yes. just have an awful lot of them. So I mentioned earlier that you can automate it so that 
it will um, so that uh, GitHub would automatically merge. Uh, so you have to use a, a GitHub action or or yeah. SDI thing or a bot or something to do this. But you could set it up so that it will just automatically merge um, minor or patch version increments of your dependencies, which is useful. Right. I think maybe depend about has a feature that will automatically do this, but I'm not completely confident on that. Right. Um, but yeah. But uh, also, like, pretty... there's there's a really, I mean, no matter what you do on GitHub, your your notifications will usually be a nightmare. There's a really good <laughs> blog post by Mike McQuaid. Uh, Mike McQuaid, managing GitHub notifications. Um, fun fact, when you join GitHub as a staff member, the first thing they have you do in onboarding is disable email notifications. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's just a mess. Uh, OK, my, my chat's not working again. This is so bizarre. Oh. Um, uh, me to share a link? Uh, yeah, can you just Google Mike McQuaid managing large managing GitHub notifications? I can't send it to you in private chat either. It feels like the internet issues that we had earlier have broken my connection to the chat for whatever reason. Mike McQuaid managing into managing what? Uh, managing uh, GitHub notifications, and you'll get a blog post on the GitHub blog about it. Yeah, I I do um, I do what he says. I turn off my my email notifications, but the new I guess this is still in beta, this new notification screen. Yeah. I found that to be helpful. Um, even just being able to filter it by, by repository, repository yeah. as well. Like I can go in and see that, oh, this is a minor version bump and the tests passed. I'm fairly sure I have tests on this repo. Yeah. I can just like look at the release notes here and I can see that, OK, it's added a TS, uh, a TypeScript thing which doesn't matter for this repo, and it's fixed a few things in the chores and maintenance. So I know this commit is actually fine. That's another yeah. thing that I should have said, actually. You can configure semantic release to yeah. um, use your commit messages to generate a change log, and then uh, include that with the releases. Include that with the release, and then Dependabot will be able to show you the release notes of your dependency. Um, of your dependencies when it makes the updates. So that's another great thing. Like your developers can just scan exactly what changed in that yeah. specific version. Nice. And then they can just merge and it's there, it's done. Landed. Yeah. Very cool. Um cool. user temporary spend it. We would love to teach you Python. We can't right now though, because this show is coming to an end. Um so yeah, thank you very much, Hugh, for walking us through all of that. Um thank you so much for having me. This is great. Yeah, super fun. Um, if folks should have any questions or want to find you on the internet, is there a place they should go? I realize, you know what we didn't talk about when you brought your synth up? Your excellent domain name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have millenniumfell.com. I lost it once, and I'll never let it go again. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, as for where to get in touch with me, uh, find me in my GitHub issues repos. GitHub yeah. repos issues. I'll be there. Yeah. Let's get up yeah. the com. I mean, the project you were showing us was Mader, Mader, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, it's, and it's my number one pinned repo right there. Yeah. Oh, I can't post banners either. Wow. Okay. Streamyard is wrecked. So, oh. uh, there we go. I do on this, this computer. Ha ha ha. This is the advantage <laughs> of having two computers. Uh, Hugh Rawlinson. Double wielding. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for being with us here today. This is a good question. Am I going to be able to remove us from the stage? <laughs> we'll <laughs> see. I'm happy to quietly. <laughs> we're just, we're just yeah. staying. This is it now. We're here all night. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you again so much. Um, and uh, we've got that blog post in the links. We'll compose all those links together and get them out to people in the when this makes it to YouTube in the description. So, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Great. Thanks for having me. This was fun. All right. Oh, I can. Excellent. Cool. So uh, thanks again, Hugh. Um, so just a brief recap there. Uh, we spoke about Hugh's path in development from Chuck, a kind of not, Isotrack not fair, but a very specific uh, programming language written for like a single purpose writing music uh, through to hackathons and JavaScript, and then into being an open source maintainer on a, a pretty cool and uh, more widely used than he realized uh, project. Uh, and the stuff, uh, the, the logistics, as he called it, that comes with maintenance and some of the cool 
uh, tips and tricks he came up with along the way to do that uh, via semantic for um, semantic release and all the things that you need to make that work. Um, so that was our last show for today. Uh, we have plenty more shows coming up. <laughs> yes, niche is the correct word to you, not esoteric. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have plenty more shows coming up uh, for the rest of the week. So we've got two days left. Um, I do I do I have banners? Can I? Banners are back. Well, hey, I just can't make new banners. Okay. Uh, our schedule for the rest of the week is at twitch.tv raise dev schedule, um, where you will be able to see our schedule for Thursday and Friday. We have three shows for Thursday and Friday. So six shows total. Let me give you a little teaser of what we've got coming up for the rest of the week. Um, tomorrow morning, uh, 10.30 uh, a.m. UTC, we have Beth Pan from Microsoft. Uh, that's going to be a maintainer show and tell. We're going to be looking at um, Beth's uh, Microsoft Graph Toolkit. Um, that's going to be cool. I'll be interested to hear about Microsoft Graph and learn a bit more about that. Um, Adrian Howard is our next show. Adrian is a developer advocate at Coria. And we're going to be talking a lot about um, this, like, how do I describe this? Uh, the expectation that you contribute to open source outside of the workplace and how it's okay to actually leave open like leave contributing to code at the door of your job so kind of open source uh, balancing that in the real world that kind of stuff as well as developer advocacy in um his career um and then the last show tomorrow is gonna be with jennifer davis jennifer davis is uh, over at microsoft she works on a lot of devops things and tomorrow she's going to show us porter which is a project she's a maintainer of porter just got accepted into the cncf um, which is the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. I can't. I can never remember what the second C stands for, but it's it's a, an organization which looks after cloud uh, projects that are important to the cloud native ecosystem um, or the cloud computing ecosystem. Uh, Porter just got added into the incubator, I believe. Um, so it's an up and coming project, uh, already widely in use. Um, and Jennifer is a maintainer of that, so she's going to be walking us through Porter. And then Friday, uh, we have Josh Dzilak, who is uh, co-founder of Orbit, which is a a really neat platform for analyzing developer communities. Um, very useful for anyone who has like a big GitHub open source project who wants to understand more about like what the, their contributors are doing. Um, but he's coming on um, and we're going to obviously hear about Orbit and what he works on. But I'm also going to do our favorite game where we get into some old code and talk about how the maintainer would do it differently today. And we're going to be doing that with a Hugo app. And then uh, the next show on Friday is Stefan Young from Customer.io. That one's going to be a fun one. Uh, he's bringing some old code that's still in use at Customer.io. It's an old SMTP server that he wrote. Uh, so that one's going to be eye-opening, I expect. I expect there'll be a lot of like, oh, this code still runs. Oh, no. Uh, so that's going to be a good one. Uh, and then the last show of the day is Corey Alexander. Um, that's a double bill where we're going to be doing both the old code game and maintainer show and tell. Corey's going to start us off with uh, looking at some old an old project with Sleep.js. No, not Sleep.js, just Sleep. Sorry, Sleep.js is a different thing. Uh, Sleep. And then we're going to look at uh, a newer project of his that is like inactive maintenance. Look at that project and how you can contribute to it and hear a little bit about its evolution. I believe the story with that one, which I, I need to check. I think the story with that one was that it moved from Bash to Rust, which I'm interested to hear more about. So that's our last show on Friday. Over the weekend, we'll update the schedule for the following week. Um, but for now, that's our shows for this week. Um, I need to put it in his calendar, but that last show may be hosted by John Britton, our founder. Um, I think he's watching. Uh, so I need to put it in his calendar. I haven't done that yet. So you will, you will get rid of me and you will have John for a show. Um, so that's all for me. Um, I need to go to bed. Uh, but for those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, we've been raised.dev. Uh, we, are, we are a service to help you level up in your developer career. So whether you're just getting started out and you're looking for your first developer job or you're trying to move from, you're trying to get a promotion or move from mid-level to senior or trying to level up your engineering team, we will help you get the experience you need to make that jump. And we are completely free whilst you're in early access and you can sign up at race.dev. If you want to get notified when we next go live, um, you can follow us here on Twitch, hit the love heart, then hit the bell, or you can follow us on Twitter at Raised Devs. We're Twitter on Raised Devs, and we tweet an hour before every show. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here, uh, including uh, our friend in chat who's now calling me Aragorn, which I would take as a compliment. I love to be Viggo Mortensen. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, whatever's left of it. Um, in the case of Nicholas N.H. Carrigan, this has been the longest day ever for you by this point. I expect you've been up since 3.30 a.m. this morning to watch our stream with Matt. I hope you sleep well tonight. Um, but if you join us again for a future show, thank you very much. We'll see you then. If not, we'll see you hopefully sometime in the future. Uh, all the best and farewell. <laughs>